with me, Patricia Windrow, with part two of a scene which I began uh, recently uh, of a, a preserve on the south shore uh, of uh, this wonderful island. And uh, part two, uh, hopefully, is going to be the resolving of this particular composition. It's a thicket. It's a, with an incidental pond, and it's also a wildlife preserve, and it is what you might call eternally fascinating for the painter. Uh, uh, be uh, also extremely difficult. So um, as long as I've got that uh, clear, then maybe I can sort of clear myself. If I do make a terrible mess out of this, then I've already forewarned you that it is one of the more difficult things to do. However, the back has been prepared. The sky, the distant landmass, some of the coloring of the trees, and begun the general feeling about the reflections in this nifty little pond. Uh, the finger, of course, does wondrous things. It can uh, scrumble and, and eliminate a great deal of brush strokes, which is what you may want sometimes when you want to diffuse the color. And uh, But the reflections are not made just by pulling color down. It is made with deliberate strokes and some careful observation of what it is that happens in watery places. Watery places are always intriguing, always extremely difficult to paint. Now, I'm going to start by doing some of these distant trees with some of the of the uh, reflections and that means that uh, the brush is uh, full of some pale color and I'm going to just sort of get a general uh, general shape of the uh, trees that are growing by the side of this pond and of course I'm going to talk immediately about the mirror image of that particular form. The mirror image is the direct opposite. It is not going to go in that direction, it's going to go in this direction and it is going to, and I'm going to run it down uh, approximately in the same uh, um, uh, angle. I mean, it should be exactly the same angle because water doesn't uh, doesn't lie. But there is the uh, the formula, uh, if there is such a thing, for painting a mirror image. Let me do that once again with a fatter one. Maybe it'll be easier to understand with a fatter one. Here's a rather large uh, tree trunk um, that is in on that distant shore, and it is uh, casting a rather much larger image down below. Uh, that's all going to be changed a little bit, but it's the general. Uh, the general lesson to be learned. Now, if you have a vertical, uh, such as here, uh, the vertical will go straight up and it'll disappear up, the, up above with a, with a branch on the side. And all of these things are because I'm, I'm looking at this for you. And here is, the, here is the mirror image of that. It is a vertical and this, um, this little branch of the tree is going to go in that direction. That is logical and also not too difficult to demonstrate. Here over on this side of the painting, which I have taken from the monitor and I have elongated, I've made this a long and thin study of this pond, uh, which, I, which, I, which is perfectly permissible if you're out there in the wild working uh, with a um, uh, with a compositional interest uh, that you want to keep going. Here are some here are some long, thin ones over here that are going to that are sort of clustered and they are uh, going off in different directions. And once again, it's the same it's the same theory that uh, whatever you see once, you're going to see it below uh, in a in in the opposite direction. Um, it's one of the things that makes this kind of uh, landscape painting very intriguing, not just for the painter, but also 
for the viewer. Uh, and uh, don't ever hesitate to try to do a, uh, a, a mirror image uh, landscape because guess what? If you make a mistake, nobody's going to give you marks on it. You're the one that is going to determine whether or not uh, you want to, are willing to try this again. So here we go. Once more, uh, the lesson, the best lesson learned is the one that's re repeated often enough to be able to be comp understood by one and all. The vertical is going to go down uh, directly below it. The branch uh, is going to be reflected in exactly the same way, only only upside down. Upside down, I guess, is the term that I was looking for. Another one going up in this direction is going to have to go down in the, um, in the opposite direction below. We put a branch in there for you to, see, to understand. This little branch goes on this side of the tree, and this one is going to be uh, reflected exactly the same way below. Not exactly. This is fine arts painting. This is not camera work. This is interpretive painting. And once again, uh, I have to emphasize to you how, uh, how challenging it is, but also how m much you can learn by, by sitting and observing. You can do this in the comfort of your own place with a tape played on your own VCR, and I can guarantee you the plot is much more interesting than what you might find on any other storytelling device on the TV, and you'll get something out of it in the end. Um, the, uh, so, so much for the demonstration of this. Let me, let me run a brush through that so that I can uh, once again show you that the surface of the water is going to determine the reflective quality of the water. Here we are. Just, just once, uh, let me pull this across here to show you that that is fairly convincing, that that is, is, is a type of reflection which is probably going to work all right. Let me little get rid of it. And uh, that's the technique. Certainly not to, um, if you pick up some of the light, you can run it over here on the dark. Certainly not to, um, to expect to be able to pull the color down. I've seen it happen very often and it doesn't work. And it's not convincing and it's uh, more tricky than it is interesting. So here we have the uh, that much uh, reflected. We have another rather uh, the spectacular spectacular reflections taking place that I'm going to do with a palette knife. I'm going to put this on with the knife because it has to be placed uh, over the present color. This is going to be the, the yellow one and see whether or not I can really sort of make this work. The yellow one is uh, is reflected almost as brilliantly as it is on the on the land, and the pu putting it on with the palette knife means that you can get some of those some of the diffused uh, reflections, which is what uh, what uh, reflections in water are. They're diffused. They're there, but they are diffused, and sometimes much more effectively put in with a palette knife than with a um, than with a brush. So here I'm picking up some of this and, and, and complementing the top. It's a sort of a rounded form, rounded here, a little bit rounded there, and then it sort of disappears as it gets further and further down. The orange one, uh, obviously the same technique, is going to be taking place almost at the water line, the water line being here, and uh, the uh, same general form of the tree has to be done in the water. A little bit of yellow introduced here, but this is the or this is the orange tree, and this is the yellow tree. Uh, as you work on these things, you will develop a, s a style and a sense of what um, what is convincing and what is not convincing. The thing to do to remember is to when you're dealing with something like this to try to, as best you can to keep your colors as clear and clean as possible. The palette knife allows you to do that. We have once, once more over here some brilliant yellow uh, and reflected almost directly below it and actually directly below it is a, is a wonderful brilliant patch of yellow also. There is probably nothing uh, as, as, as um, interesting in, in painting than to get a, uh, the effect um, uh, with simpler, the simplest possible form. Uh, if you become complicated, you kind of lose the interest of the piece and you also lose the interest of the viewer. If, it's, if, if you step back and say there's nothing but a blob of yellow paint there, how is that possible? That is what the whole point of this kind of painting is about. Uh, let me let me uh, run some uh, some of this palette knife across here for the water disturbances that I'm talking about, and I think that you'll agree that this probably works as well as anything. You can hear it happening. Um, I'm pulling it, uh, removing some of the paint as well as um, as well as uh, as 
causing the, uh, the effect of ripples in the water in these brilliant reflections. Um, this is, uh, this is the, uh, the interpretive part of this painting. The rest of it is pretty, pretty uh, realistic, but this is the part that is the interpretation. And these techniques uh, you might develop on your own, but why bother if I'm here to show you quickly how to do it, then uh, you can hear that. I'll stop talking for a minute. So, um, this is, this is a obviously called a scratch-off style. I don't mind using this in this kind of an instance. I don't rely on it very often, but I certainly don't like the business of spattering things with white to make snowflakes. I, th that I would never be guilty of doing. But here you have the water disturbances on this pond, uh, which are vital to the composition. That's why this pond, that's why this uh, piece is chosen for the uh, the uh, the surface of the um, of the pond with the complicated reflections. I think that you will probably agree that um, if you stand back, this may be convincing. And uh, if you were to do it too, it can be done only on the wet oils. The, you can't do this when it's dry, so it's to be done immediately upon the completion of the background painting, which is what you've done here. Um, oops, got some on there that I didn't want. So uh, if you make a if you make the mistake you can take it off. There you go. Almost gone. Um, another nice piece that I see in the uh, that I see in the um, monitor here is the um, is a, a, a log or something uh, something sticking up out of the water in which there is a nice mirror image as well. We'll put it right here in an obvious place. It sticks up at an angle, and guess what? It is mirror imaged um, directly below it. There it is. It's got a sort of a bump in it, and it's a it's a it's a, it's a little it's a little something, but makes for the interest of these of uh, these uh, swampy and thicket type of um, compositions. There it is, and I believe maybe that is uh, convincing that that is in fact a thing with a reflection, with a bump. Where's the bump? There it is. Okay. Anyway, all right. Time, of course, flies, and I want to get to some of the um, some of the uh, uh, tree uh, trunks of which I talked about before that make for such an interesting um, composition here. These uh, trees are something. I'm not sure what they are. Their leaves are gone. They are probably maples. Uh, the, the chances of there being maples is probably uh, accurate. And they have, as most, most uh, cylindrical objects, they have uh, a side that is dark and a side that is light. Um, the uh, the uh, gray of a tree, tree trunk in the fall is evident. Um, where, where is my gray? What happened to my... Oh, I'm in the green. Sorry! Uh, we, have to, uh, we have to modify this and turn it into gray. Uh, the green uh, which was put on is now reduced in greenness by the introduction of purple because that is opposite on the color wheel and that is what is going to be able to uh, reduce any, uh, any greenish tone. You add purple. This is the beginning and I'm using, uh, I'm using some uh, quite pale tone here because I'm going to darken up the uh, the um, sides for the three-dimensional look of a cylinder which is what a tree is um, uh, no matter how simple how uh, and how indistinct it is uh, these two forms here are going to have shape determined by shading uh, that's probably can be done with a nice square cut brush or maybe this a littler one um, dipping into the Van Dyke brown, some of this um, some of this ultramarine blue. I like to avoid using black as often as possible because black is in fact a rather dead color, as I've mentioned many times before. And here is the darker side of this of this tree to be to be interpreted with a sort of a, um, a kind of a loose hand. Uh, this is a very sharp line which I will uh, uh, diffuse by running down so you get at the same time that you do this you will get a bark like texture uh, and uh, the other side also has some darkness to it so the light is uh, striking the middle of this 
a cylinder or tree. So, uh, and it also has to stand out rather sharply from the background. Therefore, the color has got to be dark and the details have to be rather sharp. So here we have uh, a, a very quick demonstration of the technique of doing the bark of a tree. Um, you put some on and then you take some off. Uh, the interpretation is purely personal. Um, if it works for me, it's liable to work for you, but you may find a way of being able to do it yourself, which is equally as, um, as effective. However, this is uh, saving you experimental time to show you the way I do it. Um, the, the, uh, the need to make these absolutely understood and clear what they are because they are, after all, interrupting the entire background there and it has to be believable. So um, the, uh, the, the uh, interpretation of these trees is vital to the composition because they are the only vertical in the composition and they have to tell the story uh, very clearly. So uh, with, the, with that in mind, I'm going to take a very short break. I need to clean my brush and I need to reevaluate whether or not I'm pulling this off. So I'll be back very shortly. again uh, we're on to this vertical uh, part of this composition onto this tree and there are a couple of wonderful bumpy knots in it which of course makes for interest uh, if tree trunks are don't have bumpy knots they you can't identify what they are I believe these are in fact maples so here we go uh, it doesn't do, I don't have to do it extremely uh, um, uh, faithfully but uh, the knot is going to be there's the one knot on one side and then there's another one on the other one so obviously there were some old branches here that fell off and this is what's left behind. But these are uh, these little characteristics of the trees and these little uh, short uh, dark um, uh, running down of the of this of this brush gives you the texture of the tree and also gives you some some personality to it. So this the um, the interpretation of a tree uh, has got to be according to what you see. Uh, the invention of the trees that you see on some of the other programs is absolutely astonishing. They are probably uh, never been found in nature and never will and uh, not possibly but uh, they are nevertheless used so I like to be able to make sure that these trees have got some kind of personality and that we know exactly what we're what we're looking at uh, time of course is wearing out and the foreground is calling namely the uh, the fallen leaves from all of these trees in the foreground. Um, the uh, the need to do this in an interpretive way is obvious. Uh, it is uh, browns and it's uh, and I'm preparing the background for doing the paler tone of leaves uh, that uh, that will g give you the feeling that this is an accumulation and a fall of leaves on the ground. They um, 
even uh, a pile of leaves has got some pattern to it which has to be paid attention to so the dark goes on first and then the little the little dots of pale ones uh, will go on later so once again the preparation of the background is uh, is the uh, layering technique which I find essential in landscape painting I'm going to run this clear on down here I'm going to eliminate that bench pretend that the bench is uh, actually behind me rather than in front of me and then you'll see that um, probably the composition will work better that way. Uh, the, if the bench had been made out of some sort of twigs or stone or, or any other material but just a pressurized, pressure treated lumber, I would have probably been happier with it. But um, uh, the nice part is that uh, I have the ability to eliminate it if I don't like it. Uh, here, is the, here is the shoreline with the leaves that are, that are flanking the blue uh, and very dark and uh, makes for the drama uh, the dramatic feeling about this so it goes all the way across as you can uh, as you can probably interpret this is a, an extremely uh, simple composition even though it took uh, two uh, half hour sessions to try to talk about because um, uh, the simpler sometimes the more complex to make it uh, to make it come off. Uh, whatever, whatever those great mountain pictures are that are coming, uh, appearing periodically on shows of, um, means that observation has not really taken, taken hold. Here is the pale color of the leaves. It's got to be done uh, with patience, with care, with time, a little bit of, a little bit of understanding about the accumulation of these leaves that uh, will shine because the sun hits them. They, it is an, it is a, uh, it's, it's an interpretive, uh, impressionistic rendering of the leaves on the ground. And uh, uh, as you, uh, the, the demonstration obviously is simply going to continue all the way across until the rest of it is all done that way. So uh, what I need to do then is to do the, um, is to do the overhanging branches, call upon my trusty, and if I have time, I'll certainly continue with the fallen leaves. But I want to be able to enclose this with the details of that tree that is in the foreground. And coming from the top part of the picture, out of the picture, are the hanging leaves. You've got the ones that are, the, the ones that are uh, growing upwards. Now I want to show you the ones that are hanging down. Now you have to be willing to paint right over your prepared background. And here they are. According to the, according to the, uh, to the reference material, they are uh, they are growing down from the top part of the tree and they are m mixing in with all of the background uh, uh, branches therefore they've got to be somewhat darker they have to be a good deal darker to be able to have the have the contrast between the ones in the distance and the ones in the foreground so the dark ones uh, that are, are coming down from the top are in focus color focus uh, as opposed to the ones that are in the background I think you can understand the complication of these things and here we are uh, here I'm trying to uh, just in interpret uh, what it is that is coming from the top part of this picture. This does, this performs two functions. It somewhat finishes it, but it also gives you a frame, uh, a, a, um, uh, a kind of an optical framework for the thing. It closes it in. It, it, it has now told the rest of the story about this tree. This tree obviously keeps going farther up and it sends branches downward. Um, it's, uh, it's a device to keep you interested in the scene uh, because it has sort of enclosed it and it also is, a, is an opportunity to do these uh, wonderful uh, de details of these uh, very well these uh, the technique has got to be uh, has got to be carefully done uh, so that uh, so that they don't look as though they are uh, just a lot of irresponsible uh, lines coming down the the points of the branches end in a in a uh, in a uh, very fine line and it's this brush if I did not have this brush I would not have tried this particular study there is no way that you can do this without the brush uh, c c uh, growing out of the side of this tree because they are not attended to with great care uh, are some uh, suckers as they're called I believe in, in in tree language that are growing out of the side of this tree and they um, and they make for interest as well the um, 
The need to be out there observing all this is, uh, I think, should be evident in, in, in any of these compositions that I talk about. You cannot uh, remember this. You can't possibly record it in your memory and then call upon it if you're doing it somewhere else. And that's why when I see the uh, other programs that are sort of working out of, uh, out of context and inventing things as they go along, in my opinion, they do, not really, they do not really work. They do not serve, first of all, the purpose of transferring the third dimension to the second dimension, which is what, what I try to do. But they'd also eliminate some of the interesting details, such as great knots in trees and, um, and suckers that are growing out of the side and the general anatomy of a tree. This is a little bit, this is a little bit stark and sharp, and I'm going to reduce it now by unpainting some of this. Now, this is called scumbling, and it's um, it's uh, essential to have to have a painterly look about it. None of nothing is really uh, clearly etched and outlined, uh, such as you see in cartoons or in drawings. Uh, it is painted and interpreted. Um, I believe there is a slightly lighter look to some of the bark of this tree. Maybe down here, maybe the light is catching it a little bit, and so. The details are, are, are one of the things that I'm interested in. I'm going to separate these two trees with some lightness here uh, by separating the two. I think that that probably will work. As, so, uh, as usual, there is a general interpretation of this kind of thing. Now, uh, there is some grass, uh, in, uh, oddly enough, that has uh, been uh, not totally died yet uh, in, this, um, in this preserve, even though the leaves have fallen. And so it's the introduction of another color, which is nowhere else in the composition, making it, uh, making it once again an observational wonder that uh, there is grass still showing. Uh, I don't think that anybody would have uh, made note of this uh, on their own. Uh, it's right here. It is easier to work from life than it is to work from your imagination. A lot of people say, I can't do, I can't work from, from life, it all, it's all too confusing. But the information is all there. All you have to do is to look at it, observe it, and interpret it. So um, the advice always is, work from life, it is easier. Uh, it's uh, maybe a contradiction to some, but uh, if you get out there and do it once, I think that you'll agree that it in fact does work that way. So. Here we have uh, the leaves have fallen on top of the grass that is still somewhat green, and uh, the whole story is supposedly told here. There is wildlife in the form of some ducks. And if my little brush, my little duck brush, will work properly, I'll see if I can't do some rather uh, uh, quick interpretation of the fact that this is a wildlife preserve and the ducks have got mm, this brilliant green uh, the only time that I am ever willing to use thalo green is when mallard ducks are around and they have these wonderful brilliant green heads and uh, the point that the, the the challenge here is to get them the right size if you don't get them the right size then they look like monster ducks and it's no longer interesting so uh, uh, they move, and so when you're out there in the wild, you have to sort of work fast, but uh, the general shape is what you're after. Um, there they are, and they come, a little, a little brown chest comes around here, and if you're in, absolutely intent upon having it uh, identified as a mallard, you would put that little white streak around it. The, um, oh, they have a little dark bill. The little bill is in, is in uh, profile. Okay, and he's got a bill, but he does have a white streak around his um, around his chest, which tells you that that's a, around his neck, which tells you that that's a mallard, and it may be an un unimportant detail, but I'm going to put it in anyhow. Um, his body is sort of a pale colored; it's it's grayish. Uh, see if we can pull this off. I'm not sure. Well, not really. Not enough time. But um, we're going to see if we can't. Oh, well, he's got some. He's got some. Some, a little tail that sticks up, a little dark tail sticks up, and he's got some feathers on there. Um, uh, this, is the, this is the problem. He also has a little curly tail, I believe, and this is the problem that you run into when you're attempting to do uh, animals in pictures. Uh, they have to be clear, carefully observed or they really don't work, and uh, sometimes I can manage to carefully observe these things, but probably when you're out there, the cutest thing that can happen is one of these little creatures come along and, uh, and uh, are somewhat curious about what is happening, and they uh, sort of cooperate. Well, 
as usual, I have run out of time. I'm going to put another, just one little white, uh, white uh, streak on this duck's back to make sure that he is a mallard. Anyway, mallard painting and so on uh, for the morning. That's it. This is part two, finally, of a, uh, of a lovely scene here in the wilds of Long Island. I hope that it was uh, informative uh, as well as entertaining, and maybe even that you could use some of the information. Thanks again for watching. I'm on the air three times a week, in case you wondered. Uh, I believe it's Friday at 8, Thursdays at 11, and Friday, no, no, Mondays at 8, Thursdays at 11, and Fridays at 9. And then, of course, live on the last Tuesday of every month. Thanks again for watching. This is me saying bye.